Well, hello, lovely listeners. Today, I have the wonderful Robert O'Deck. Rob is the man behind the YouTube channel Observation Deck, which I don't think I ever really got a chance to look at, um, obviously, before it got taken down. But it was a, a channel where, in the early days, it looked at historical anomalies and questioned everything that the history books were stating. Yes, I am totally concurring with all of that. Um, but you you moved from researching historical matters towards the same kind of research, but focused on English laws and specifically the laws and obligations on both parties surrounding debt. We all know a lot about debt. Everybody fucking hates debt. Um, you've done quite a few ebooks um, to help others to understand the reality of the world that we live in. Um, but your latest one, which is called Diffusing the Debt Bomb 2, has really taken the, the use of the latest technology and incorporated an optional AI, because you have your own AI uh, on ChatGPT, don't you? Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to help the consumer to understand the laws and draft replies to question, questionable claims. Um, you also created an, and you run Law Explore, which is a platform for self-education on all types of law, and it's a research tool which makes locating information with the power of AI a lot easier than it was before. And so you've yeah. got lawexplore.io. Um, you've obviously got your diffusing the debt bomb too. And courtesy of whoever, uh, you are now on Rumble, not on YouTube. Yeah. So welcome, Rob. Thank you so much. I know you're a busy man. I am so grateful to have you here today. I I am uh, honoured to be on your show, Mel. And um... You know, a mutual friend of ours put us in touch with each other. And uh, obviously, this is part of me coming back and building stuff up again, despite the uh, the tsunami that came down against me in the recent months. And I mean, I'm not going to go into too much detail because it's not a, it's not a wah, wah, wah kind of uh, yeah. chat we're having here. But um, I'm, I'm sure my 80 odd thousand subscribers that were on YouTube uh, are fully familiar with uh some of the circumstances as to why the channel was taken down um and other things but um that's all ongoing but uh i'm certainly not licking my wounds curled up in the corner um i'm literally going to build it all back up again because i'm yeah. not one to shy away from a good yeah. fight yeah um well we, we've had a nice chat before hit and record today and um it's the first time i've met rob and Passionate is the first word that comes to mind, for sure. Um, knowledgeable and just a bloody nice chap, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, thank you. Um, and he's got, if you're only listening and not watching, he's got a superb backdrop as well um, behind him. So I and the viewers and the listeners love a bit of a backstory, Rob. So um, I've got an idea of who you are and what you do today and obviously the challenges that you continually face at the moment. But what, what was life like for Rob, you know, growing up or as a younger man? You know, what were your aspirations? Take us back as far as you want to, just to give us an idea of really the story behind the man and any, you know, any sort of events or pivotal moments in your life that has twisted and turned you into where we are right now. Well, I think like everybody, um, our we are molded by nature and nurture, as they say. And my mindset, I guess, going in, into my youth and, and my adulthood was based around, unfortunately, uh, an abusive childhood. Um, Sorry to hear um, that. And constant, I mean, if, if, if we lived in that time today, then um, my father would have been locked up. But, um, you know, held prisoner in a dark cupboard under the stairs for three days at a time without food or water for coming in late on. Um, and wow. all, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but it wasn't a very happy time. Um, Is that why but, Harry Potter's behind you? But, well, that's not actually Harry Potter. That well, it is, sort of looks a bit like him, doesn't well, it? All right. It looks a little bit. <laughs> Harry Potter. Yeah. Um, but um, I guess that shaped my um mindset to rebel against authority because growing up that was the only authority i knew and it wasn't a nice one um so um i learned very early on that i, I 
I had a real problem with someone who would or anyone that turn around and go, uh, well, you've got to respect authority. The, 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 that was a, the, the word authority was a trigger word for me to to like, no, respect is earned mm. and nobody has authority over me unless I allow it. it. It's not something that's imposed. It's something that I choose. And that's the difference. Um, so, of course, I had a problem with authority growing up. You know, as a teenager, you have run-ins with the local police for, I don't know, playing knock door run and all this kind of stuff. I mean, I, I, I grew up in the late 60s, early 70s. And, you know, the most serious of crimes at the time was playing knock door ginger or uh, b burning bags with dog poo in, on the doorstep and having them. It, it, it was petty stuff, looking back on it and, and stuff like that. So there was, there was no real stuff like that but it was just teenage kids growing up but then you learn to curtail it but i think my mind was molded already by by that time in terms of to question everything which is what was i mean you say you didn't watch the observation yet but i do have a phrase that i use all the time which is um question everything believe nothing and stay curious um and that's my sign off on on every one of my videos and I, it's not just a sign off. They are things I live by because I will question every statement that's made to me, every claim that's made to me. It, it doesn't matter what the information is. Um, I remember one time uh, I was sitting in the classroom and my religious education teacher, who actually taught history rather than, but it was on the curriculum at the time when I was at school. And I, rather than sit in the back, because I'm not a particularly religious person, uh, it doesn't make me not a spiritual person. It just makes me not believe in a third century book that was written by a bunch of guys in the Vatican. Um, but he, I'd sit in the front row because it was knowledge. And I love new information, uh, as, as many of us do, which is why I've always said, stay curious. The curiosity of a child is the greatest gift you can carry into adulthood. D never lose it. But unfortunately, the system is built but we do because the system is designed itself to make us so busy and so stressed that we forget about ourselves yeah. and we go we we go from exploration to survival and 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 that that is maintained today and um, obviously they've added distraction now which is called bread and circuses which is like TikTok, facebook uh trash tv and all of this stuff to keep the mind busy on other people's lives and we tend to forget to focus on our own. Um, but when you do start to focus on your own and you keep in mind, question everything, you know, um, it, it, you start to realize that the world is not what it seems. Mm. And I was sitting in the classroom and I, I put my hand up to the religious education teacher. And, and he said, look, homework, study bits and pieces of the Bible. Well, I did as I was told because I was curious. And at that age, I didn't know whether it was true, false or somewhere in the middle. So I came into the following lesson. I said, I've got a question. He said, what's that, Robert? I said, you, you stated that God is omnipresent, which means everywhere. And he said, that's correct. I said, but it says here, he asked Satan from whence did they come? So there's obviously somewhere where he's not because he didn't know where he came from. And he's like, uh, what? Nobody likes a smart okay. car, Robert. <laughs> well, no, on the second question, because I'd already had these set up, I turned around and said, can God do anything? And he went, okay, I'll bite. He said, yes, God can do anything. I said, can he build a wall that he can't climb over? He said, get out. <laughs> and I'm like, fair question. I spent more time facing the wall in the corridor than I did in the classroom. Um, and it actually does say, and you can check your Bible, folks, it didn't say God at all. It said God's plural. So there's more than one. All right. But let's not get into the Anunnaki or anything like that. But the, the, okay. the, the point is um, that started the curiosity. And um, I mean, I'm going to skip loads, but um, because they're going to stay on that area for too long. But um, when I grew up and I, I was so enamored with the, how the mind works, how we perceive the world. So I studied psychology at the Open University. 
Um, then I studied neurolinguistic programming. And sorry, I just I, I didn't only just study hypnosis. Uh, I studied forensic hypnosis. I was a lecturer at King's College University uh, for um, a, a weekend group of trainers. So it wasn't like proper university at King's College, but we did use the facilities and um, was teaching people um, hypnosis, hypnosis inductions, uh, morals, ethics, and all this kind of stuff. And they still had to go through exam. It was a two year course, not a weekend. Oh, and now I can hypnotize people. Two years, these people had to study in order to become a hypnotherapist. Um, and I, I started the course and ended up as one of the lecturers on the course as well on, on forensic hypnosis. And then neurolinguistic programming, which is hypnosis by another name. They just changed the labels anyway. But um, and Ericksonian stuff and all the rest of it. And with all that in mind, I, I got more and more curious about the, the esoterical side of it, like past life regressions. And I would sit there and think, OK, yeah, I've run hundreds, literally hundreds of past life regression scenarios with different people um, for their own reasons and my research. And then I thought to myself, OK, but let's start seeing if we can run forward life progressions because time is not linear. No. So if you lot are going back, why is everybody just traveling backwards? <laughs> it's really boring to me, you know, and you wouldn't believe the amount of, you wouldn't believe the number of Napoleons I met along the way, you know. <laughs> but, um, I'm convinced I'm uh, Bodicea, by the way. <laughs> oh, well, good luck to you. I, I watched that on, was it Netflix or Prime? They've just bought out the new uh, Boudicca or Bodicea. I know, I they call it Boudicca now, don't they? But, um, oh, I didn't know. Oh, I'll check that out. Yeah, have a look at it. But, um, you know, uh, it's, it's entertainment. It, it, that, that's, that's what it is. Um, but... Um, yeah, with that background in mind, um, to cut a long story short, I went into the corporate sector. Do you still do that, by the way, the hypnosis and the regressions? And um, now and again for friends and family, but I don't openly advertise right. that a a anymore. Um, although, you know, you never lose the, the skill. And I don't have to read induction sheets anymore because it's just there. It de because it, it, it depends on the personality in front of you as to what induction or what is the best way to put them into a relaxed state? You, you can't just, one size like everybody else does not fit all, mm. you know. But I ended up with a protocol that was a mix of um, rapid eye movement, neurolinguistic programming, and what we call waking hypnosis. And I would literally, they wouldn't sit in a chair and, and be relaxed anymore. They would stand up, have a conversation with me. 10 minutes later, I say, now, can you recall why you came to see me? Yes, I can. But on a subunit, uh, um, subunit uh, scale of distress you gave me a seven when you walked in the door what number is it now I, no i can't even find a number so how do you feel about that you know and it's like i yeah, yeah but the, what i want to know is what the hell just happened <laughs> you know because you know there are certain fundamental mechanisms in the human mind that uh have to take place in order for a chain reaction to take place and if you know what you're doing you can actually break the link in the chain like, for instance, if I say to you, Mel, um, when, where did you go on holiday last? Uh, Sorrento. Sorrento. And uh, what's your best memory of Sorrento? Oh, just the old fashioned. You can stop there. See, why did you go there like that and look up? <laughs> Is there something in the room that you can look at? No, there isn't. What you did was you access your I access cues, right? It's a bit like opening a memory filing cabinet, want of a better phrase. So depending on where you're, the, the direction of your eyes, and despite what the neuro-linguistic programming books say, not everybody has the same cues. You have to talk to them for a while to find out where theirs are. And there is some rumor that it depends whether they're left or right-handed, but I haven't really found any evidence of that anyway. Right. But the point being is, knowing all of this, if you then ask a particular type of question and you know in order for them to answer that question, say if it was a traumatic memory, all right, they will go bottom left for argument's sake. Yeah. You give them instructions and I used to put my finger up and, and pass it along in um, like an infinity sign. Yeah. And, when, and, and the instruction was no matter what happens or what I say, your eyes must follow this finger. So that's the rapid eye movement, isn't it? Correct. Yeah. Right. 
all the time neurolinguistic programming. Uh, for instance, information, seven plus or minus two pieces of information given to the conscious mind. The conscious mind literally shuts down, can't handle the overload. So whatever you're saying goes straight into the subconscious, just like hypnosis, even though you're wide awake and you're having a conversation. So if I tell you to hum happy birthday and also count backwards from 100 and I'm doing all of this, your brain's just going, what the hell? And it just doesn't handle it. But what it's actually doing when I say your brain is your conscious brain is saying what the hell, not your subconscious. It can do a million. But because this is busy, do, following those instructions, I can talk directly to the subconscious. Um, I mean, there's a bit more to it to that, but that's the bottom line. That's, that's the bottom line, but, right. But I make sure that when I ask the question, I know that my finger is in the dipole opposite area of where that I need to access that memory. Right. Which means it can't get there because it's been given other inst opposite instructions by the movement, okay, of, of the finger. You do this and you compound it three times and then you snap them out of it and then you have another conversation which is laced with NLP and hypnosis anyway, or waking hypnosis. And eventually, after about 15 minutes, they're done. And the beauty about it is, it doesn't matter how severe they think the trauma is, it's irrelevant. The mechanisms work. Can I ask you a quick question on that? Because I've got personal experience of somebody um, that had rapid eye movement for a traumatic event. Yep. And, it, and it definitely did help that however what i was on the receiving end of really was his um frustrations and anger getting worse and worse and worse after he'd had that that's probably i mean i'm not going to knock anybody or, or another professional but they might not have known what the rest of the conversation should have been yeah if he's not telling it yeah yes because there are checks and balances because the, the rapid eye movement is one thing, but when it is stacked with an ongoing rapid conversation that the conscious can't handle. I mean, I used to talk like a machine gun deliberately. And while they were humming happy birthday, counting backwards from a hundred and all the rest of it, which meant that it's like smokers, for instance, um, smokers say, will there be any withdrawal symptoms? I said, no, you've already had them. He said, well, no, I haven't. I said, no, but by the time I finish with you, your brain's going to think that you've already stopped three weeks ago. So there's, there will be none. And then every time you think of a cigarette, you think, actually, I'm a non-smoker. You know, and all this kind of stuff. So if you know what you're doing, you, you anticipate the leakage for an incomplete session, which is the anger and frustration. Because he's like, I don't know where this is coming from. No, that should have been shut down during the yeah. session. Yeah. If you'd have known completely what you were doing and yeah. what the possible side effects could be, or the, what we call uh, psychological leaks, emotional leaks, coming from the temporal area of the brain. Well, you shut that down and you break those links. So you can't access neither, because remember, you've got a memory that gives you the visual. You've got a separate memory that gives you this, the audio. All your five senses are filed in different areas. If any three or more senses converge on a single point, that include that that equals a memory from a different filing cabinet. The emotional content of that memory then gets fired. Like you hear a piece of music, you remember where you were if it's meaningful to yeah. you and, and that kind of stuff, right? But the music comes first. So there's the audio input. Then all of a sudden your brain fires up and goes, does it meet this, this and this criteria? Yeah. Oh, there's your memory. All this happens in a nanosecond. But all we get to consciously understand is there's a memory. Oh, that reminds me of that. Yes. But now let's go back through the mechanics of why and what happened in that millisecond in order for you to have that pop in your brain. Because a world of things happen in that millisecond and you just have to back engineer what it is so each memory each each portion of a memory has its own filing cabinet and the way to unlock the very first one is your eye access cues now when that fat filing cabinet is drawn open as it were i'm using this as a metaphor but and 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 this file comes out that file cross references with other stuff 
And depending on the context of that memory, it will cross reference other stuff that is meaningful to you and give you that memory. So if you've got this, whether it's a trauma or it's a wonderful memory, um, the, 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 the mechanisms are always the same because we're human. It, 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 it doesn't differ across race, color, culture, or creed. We're human, and that's how the synaptic junctions fire. So if you know the mechanisms, then you can stop the possible leakages because what had happened, or what sounds like is happening, is that they were not taken into consideration. So the temporal lobe area, which is responsible for, for emotions, um, well, actually, it's the limbic system, to be precise, um, um, that was not addressed because the emotions are in a different filing cabinet. So what happened was the memory may have been curtailed, but the emotion filing cabinet wasn't even looked at. Which is why you use phrases such as and any associated root cause that may cause you discomfort will also be severed and deleted. They are no longer of use to you, but don't pick on your mind that it gives you a negative feeling because it's designed to protect you. So mm. thank your mind for it and just let it know that you no longer require those negative emotions, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. It's a very soft approach, but a very powerful one. Interesting. Sorry, I, I derailed yeah. you a bit on a personal front, but um, that was really interesting. And uh, you know what? You're making me want to go and learn NLP and all the rest of it, which I never wanted to do before. But anyway, so... Well, I mean, that's my background, and yeah. I... I ended up in the corporate sector as a learning development specialist because obviously, you know, of my background, um, the psychology side of it. And I spent quite a few years there. I got quite high up uh, in um, Virgin Media at the time. Richard, I mean, my only boss was one guy off of Richard Branson. Um, I was head of um, and so you, you do train the trainer courses. So I started out as training. Uh, different areas of the business whether it be sales whether it be the call center uh, and, and redesigning how they speak to people on the phone uh what the sales pitch was and and all the rest of it and i was very much a believer in bringing morality into the sales arena uh for instance i never agreed with the upsell concept um which i got me into a lot of trouble on a lot of occasions because I said, if they don't need it, you don't sell it. Mm. OK, um, and I had several incidences. And but after a while, the management could see actually it was increasing profits because the reputation was working, saying, actually, they're, they're, they're being transparent. You know, I one poor little old lady when a guy was door knocking. And I used to go out with them to assess them. And then we'd sit and have a coffee, have a discussion. You know, these were new recruits and, and so on and so forth. And um, we, he knocked on a door and I'm standing right next to him. A little old lady said, I'm already with Virgin Media. And I said, oh, that's fantastic. I said, um, uh, what, what sort of package are you on? She goes, oh, I paid £27 a month for this, that and the other. She goes, but I'll be honest with you, because my husband passed away a year ago. She says he dealt with all that stuff. She goes, I don't watch the sports or anything like that. She says, but it's still on there. And I went, oh, excuse me. I said, um, but we can help you deal with that. And I went in the house. Um, she invited us in, uh, sat down and the sales guy was next to me. And he goes, what are you doing? I said, just watch. Mm. It's called customer service. Mm. Right. I said, right, show me your packages. Now, obviously, I knew the packages inside said, Right, let's just establish. That's all you want. Yes? Yes. I picked the phone up because I've got a direct line to sales. And I said, and I told him who I was. And, and they went, oh, right. I said, go get your line manager, will you? And because I trained all the line managers. So anyway, uh, Bobby's name was. I said, hey, Bob, it's Rob here. For, he said, oh, well, how are you getting on, mate? I said, that's great. I said, can you have a look in the system? And I gave him the details and everything. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, can you remove the sports package? And I explained why and this, that, and the other. And just give her the basic passage on such and such and let me know how much that costs. I knew it was going to be nine quid anyway. Um, he went, yeah, yeah, I could do that for you. Hang on. He said, right, that's all done. I said, what's the cost? He said, nine pound. I said, thanks a lot, mate put the phone down i said then i explained it all to her and she just sat there and she went oh my god she said i needed every penny she said you've just saved me 25 quid a month i said not a problem i said there's no point in you having that i said now you have a lovely day and uh, enjoy your soap operas right 
and left. The salesman walked out and he said to me, he goes, but you went the opposite way. I said, yes, because it was the right thing to do. Yeah. Right? The beauty of it, honestly, Mel, we walked up one side of the street and down the other side, right? And by the time we got down the other side, which maybe took an hour, right? In, and we were in Swansea, I recall, right? Knocked on a door, lady opened the door, maybe mid thirties, early forties. And she goes, are you the guys from Virgin Media? She said, yeah, she goes, I saw you out the window. She said, you went into Mabel's house. She goes, no, and I'm a little bit wary because I know she lives on her own and all the rest of it. She goes, and I was absolutely amazed at what she said. <laughs> she said, I'd like to have Virgin Media, please. I said to the salesman, I said, there you go. There I, said, go. I said, now, and when he came out, I said, now do you understand? And he went, wow, what a lesson. I went, if you treat others that way, the word gets around. And I, despite what the world tells you, good news also travels just as fast as bad news. Yeah. So just because they say bad news sells has got nothing to do with the speed it can get spread in terms of good news you know so so for me um that was a good you know that, that's a good example of how i used to train uh people but in the end um i had to leave virgin media because i got to a level where um egos got in the way in the boardroom um and they didn't like some of the things i was saying one guy my immediate line manager didn't like the fact that i had a direct line to the ceo and not him and I came up with um, a project that saved the company two and a half million a year. And I presented it in a, in, in a room to some senior heads of department. And at the same time, the CEO walked in. He said, oh, Rob, he said, what's going on here? And I explained, and we've saved two and a half million, blah, 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 blah. He said, oh, that's fantastic. He says, can you send me that report? And I said, yeah, no problem. You know, Naturally, I told my line manager, I said, oh, it's fantastic. It's like blah, 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 blah. He said, you will not send him that report. You will pass it through me. And I said, excuse me? He goes, you will pass it through me. Well, me having a problem with authority from early, early childhood wasn't going to take shit from someone who thought he was going to take credit for it or completely block it. Right. So I said, well, Mick, I said, uh, let me ask you a question. If you were in my position and your line manager gave you an order and the CEO of a company gave you an order, which one would you follow? I said, you can guess what I'm going to do. And uh, he, the company managed me out over a six month period. Goodness sake, for that. For that, yeah. And don't worry, I took him to the industrial tribunal and won a substantial. <laughs> I'm not surprised, Rob. Yeah, and I spent six months on uh, stress sick leave at full pay as well, just to rub it in. Yeah. Um, but so I left the corporate sector, carried on working in L and D for a private company up and down the country, and uh, much to my surprise, now this might scare some of the the viewers, but it is what it is, and there's nothing else but what it is. So there's no underlying thing. But um, the company I was working for got a call one day from the Ministry of Defence and said, we need somebody in your company to teach us about leadership. Now, this was no ordinary Ministry of Defence. This was a highly top secret location that you're not allowed to talk about and you wouldn't believe the security there. This was not just your army base. There was nobody on that base with a rank lower than Colonel, right? And it, at one point, um, I've and I've got the evidence because I've got letters from Lieutenant Colonel saying you've done a fantastic job and blah, 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 blah. And at one point, um, I was actually training um, the head of the Pacific Fleet, Admiral uh, uh, Duncan. I can't remember his second name now, but he was in the room. Um, so I'm thinking, holy yeah. Were you intimidated or did you just take it in your stride? I just took it in my stride because it was just another lecture theatre full of people that were listening to what I was blabbling on about, you know. Yeah. Um, obviously, I gave it a military slant, you know, <laughs> like great, great quotes from generals in the past, the art of war and all this kind of stuff. But then we got into the nitty gritty of, uh, of, of, of leadership and the difference 
of between the mindset that is compelled to follow and those who want to follow you know um, and the difference between the two and all this kind of stuff you know um and i did find out some stuff there which i'm clearly not allowed to talk about on on air but um there are a lot more they work uh we took we, we human beings work without realizing it on what you call time horizons now a time horizon is installed into you without your knowledge and depending on where you are in society your time horizon gets larger and larger and larger the higher up you go the longer your time horizon so let me explain that in normal english mm. most of our time horizons are four weeks why because we get bills monthly and we get paid monthly right so we we live from month to month then you move up the ladder a little bit say like bankers and investors and their time horizon is three months because you've got the four quarters the physical quarters in the year so they're planning for 12 weeks and 12 weeks and 12 weeks then you got like the venture capitalists their time horizon is anywhere between one five and maybe 10 years so they're planning <laughs> accordingly and they look further ahead and then as you move up the scale now people need to understand and you know this goes into the world of conspiracy and the, the shadow government and all the rest of it their time horizon when i mean cut all the crap in between but their time horizon is generations mm. because of bloodlines and all the rest of it so we're not talking decades here we're talking 20 year plus plans to, to move the, the nation or the people in a direction they want to go and keep giving them little wins along the way because without hope, then they can't expect to sail them in a particular direction. And that's been going, and that time horizon has been going on for thousands of years. Yeah. So you can see that as you go up the pyramid, there is actually an invisible pyramid that widens because the time horizon is even longer. Okay, I called it the apex theory. And um, it's true, because you've only got to look at the accounting from your bank account, my bank account, up to the venture capitalists and the HBCs and the central bankers of the world and see the, the timing of their bank accounts, which is, it mimics the same thing. So you've got this, right, we work on four weeks, so our mentality is in that shell. And we can't think beyond four weeks because we're worried about the next gas bill or whatever it might be, right? And they're calculating 20 year plus cycles. And, and, and that's the difference in the strategies. And you could imagine that your strategy would change depending on your time horizon. Mm, totally. um, so, you know, so you, you get to see the world from a slightly different lens, from, from a slightly different uh, perspective, as it were. So, of course, because I love the curiosity, when I left the corporate sector and I worked for the MOD and I saw a little bit of an insight of what's going on inside. Um, again, the company I was working for, they had financial difficulties. They weren't able to pay me. So I just uh, and I made the final decision. I remember about five or six years ago now uh, to say, you know what? I'm going to risk everything. and do something myself. And uh, strangely enough, I had a passion and I still do actually, uh, I have a passion for photography and um, Me too. Uh, drones, you know, for, you know, and so I start, which is why my email is pegasusvideos.com. Yeah. That's, that's a, a, a legacy email, which I've always kept from the company that I used to run Pegasus videos. And I used to do things like, um, uh, you know, like the big country estates where you've got the pullback from, yeah, from yeah, yeah. The, the, the drone and all this kind of stuff and all the rest of it. So, so the, the, uh, the realtors, uh, sorry, the estate agents can use that then to sell it on their TV and, you know, in the window and all. So I used to do a lot of that kind of work. Used to do bridge inspection work, uh, weddings and your usual stuff, you know. Um, but it wasn't paying. It wasn't it wasn't paying the bills. There was plenty of work coming in, but not enough on a regular basis. And it was very time consuming because obviously, as you know, on top of all of that, you've then got to do all the production work behind the scenes and the video mm -hmm. editing and, 
and, and, and what have you. Um, and my daughter at the time, uh, she was working with me. She got a full time job, which she's doing very well at, at the moment. Um, so I decided then, you know what, because I'm doing videos anyway, I'll start a YouTube channel. I had no idea what the content was going to be. I just felt like doing a YouTube channel. And uh, I just happened to end up calling it the observation deck. And in the early days, because of this curiosity and question everything, and obviously, you know, my background in research in terms of uh, the human mind, I've been curious about everything. And I've been on the internet since it was launched. I'm that old, you know. Um, I started looking at history because it's always interested me. I mean, okay, the people people think I'm I'm mad now. I've got my flat cap and I'm in the middle of thing. And even though you can't see it because of this backdrop, I've got like the latest med uh, metal detectors. I used to go treasure hunting and all this stuff. And um, obviously nowadays I simply don't have time to do that. But it was still an interest in history. You know, I've got coins that are two thousand years old from the Roman era, hammered silver, and all this kind of stuff, and it, and the details and all that kind of stuff and the history of it always intrigued me. So I started looking into history, um, and unfortunately, you, you can't see it on the channel now, but it did very, very well, very quickly. I, I think I went from two thousand subscribers in the early days to forty thousand inside six weeks, just doing the history stuff. Just, just the history stuff. It, it caught me completely by surprise. Yeah. Um, then I did one particular episode. Well, two actually stand out uh, from memory. And I will put them up on my Rumble channel because they were so popular. One was Mount Vesuvius and Pompeii. Oh, that's where I visited uh, this year. Right. So I evidenced that it was an utter historical lie. Oh. Right. And the second one was called One World, Two Species where all of the artifacts that have been found, the, 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 the bones and everything and the skulls and all the rest of it, um, it was clear that the elongated skulls, despite what the systems say they are, you know, they've been boarded up and then wrapped around the particular cultures to elongate the skull. That doesn't change the internal volume of the human cranium. It just distorts it. But this, you, every elongated skull is very much larger than the human cranium. But what the killer blow is, is that on, on a, a number of the elongated skulls, we as human, Homo sapien, have a little squiggly line in the middle of our brain, our, our skulls, which at birth flexes so we can come down the birth canal. And that is called the sagittal suture. And the elongated skulls do not have a sagittal suture. Right. So they're not human. Yeah. Because they didn't come down a birth canal. Yeah. Right. What they get, the only suture that they've got is one that comes across the front. We have a T shape. They only have one line across the front. There is no sagittal suture. They cannot be human. Ergo, they weren't a tribe of people that were mimicking their gods. And even if that were true, the question then remains is, which gods were they mimicking them with funny skulls? You know, so anyway, those were, those were two. Pompeii, Pompeii did erupt. Uh, sorry, Pompeii didn't erupt. Uh, Vesuvius oh, erupted. Yeah. yeah. Um, but not the story that we've been given. It, it's as simple as that, because it didn't wipe it off the face of the earth, because... Um, they said Pompeii wasn't rediscovered until the late 18th, early 19th century. And I showed every map between 1435 or something right up to that point in time. And it all had Pompeii on it. I said, well, perhaps they should have asked us cartographers where it was because they knew. You know, so it wasn't lost to anybody. Secondly, there's a monument just outside. Um, is it N Nicosia or I can't remember, but it, uh, there's a monument outside of on the road and it was covered over with. So it's been there for hundreds of years and it's got a cross on it and it's dated 1647. And it says for all those people who lost their lives in the Vesuvius eruption on Pompeii, 1647. It's a monument to a much later date, which then leads you down another, another rabbit hole that we haven't got time to talk about. But, um, and then one of the most damning ones, that you could see it was a scam, 
right? And it is a scam because it's designed, Pompeii is designed as a tourist attraction like Disney World to make money, right? Because I'm looking at all of the first, now remember I go metal detecting, there is a connection here, right? I have loads of Roman era coins. So I know who was on the throne at what point in, in what century, right? And the archaeologists give us these great big one. Oh, look what we've just uncovered. Here's a mosaic on the floor in a first century house in Pompeii. What yeah. wonderful work and all the rest of it. And they think people like me aren't going to stay curious because the top of the frieze, it had a whole vista of fruit and some fishes and some other bits and bobs. And in the fruit bowl was a pineapple. <laughs> the pineapple didn't even come to Europe until after Columbus had come back from his sails in 1642. So what's it doing on a first century freeze in Pompeii? Mm. So, uh-uh, slipped up, didn't you? You put a pineapple 600 years before it should have been there. So with your, um, your brain, Jesus, do you sleep at night anyway? Um... <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> But then that, re that, that research then, I mean, it, in fact, I can blame, I'm, I'm going to give him a shout out, Gumshoe Sleuth, Craig, right? He gets, uh, I, I watched one of his videos and got intrigued by some of the stuff he was saying and got in touch. And he actually said to me, he said, I was wondering how long it would take you now that you've gone through all of this history stuff and you've literally just trounced every single claim, right? He said, I was wondering how long it would take you to take a look at English law right and i said well it's a journey but what focused my mind on english law it wasn't english law to start with well it did involve like some of the charters but i only just touched on them from a historical point of view not a remedy mm. point of view or anything like mm. that um you know obviously the magna carta and land settlement act and all this kind of stuff and but it would it literally just formed part of history stuff not the focus of it. But what did push me into uh, the world of Remedy was that I'm doing another historical video, walked into the front room one day, and my wife um, was sitting there with a lever arch file, and she's not very good at hiding her emotions. And we, I mean, we've been married nearly 10 years, and we, we still love each other to bits and have a wonderful relationship. You know, we're, like, we're best mates as well. And uh, so right, for her, while I'm talking to you, she's in she's in Spain at the moment, sending me pictures. She's sitting in a bar with her mates having a drink. <laughs> Good for her. Good for her. <laughs> um, but anyway, walked to the front room and you could see she was kind of like she was just wiping the tears from her eyes. And of course, that that caught me off guard. And I said, well, I said, what, what's wrong? And she goes, oh, I'd rather not talk about it. I said, well, you need to. But something's affecting you. And I, I want to know. I said, and. And if there's anything I can do to help, let me know. And she goes, well, you might as well know now. She was a very proud woman and she didn't want to be embarrassed by the fact that before she met me, she, not through any fault of her own, I hasten to add, had accumulated all this debt because someone else had left her in the shit and used credit cards in her name and this, that and the other. And oh, anyway, anyway. Um, so I went through this lever arch file. I kid you not. It wasn't a case of how many pages. It was literally that thick. Wow. Right. And she was paying. Now, she's an NHS nurse. And as you well know, they don't get paid an awful lot of money. And she was giving about 30% of her earnings every month to step change so they could satisfy all these people. That, right? wasn't, even, that wasn't even her that created it? Uh, no. No. Um, and they were threatening this, that and the other. And this was just the latest threat. Right. I looked at that and I thought. And I remember the conversation Craig said, I wonder how long it would take you to get into English law. And I'm thinking, right, well, now I'm now. going to, <laughs> because I don't like the idea and nobody would of their family or wife being upset or attacked in this way. So I, I, I had a cursory look to start with. Um, and uh, the very first thing I did, I'll be honest with you, was take over power of attorney for all of this. The next instruction I gave her was stop paying step change, send them this letter to say I've now come into new information and, and I wish to cease payments. 
And they wrote back and basically said, well, you know, you're going to have to deal with them directly, which is exactly what I intended to do. Um, then I really stuck my head in the world of debt in order to help my wife. Out. Um, it was hard going to start with because I was working blind. I, I didn't know. And I didn't really get on to all of these other debt remedies on, on the Internet. That's not how I work. I'm a researcher. I'm a big boy and I can do my own work. So I was pretty focused on, on finding out firsthand for myself. And the only websites I visited was the government website on civil procedure rules and the law and consumer laws. I didn't need anything else. All right. So I started doing this, making notes. I mean, I've got books here where I've made handwritten notes, volumes of the damn things. Um, and you wouldn't believe behind me in the filing cabinet, I've got a pile about a foot and a half of debt agent letters and all the rest of it and correspondence and all the rest of it. Anyway, cut a long story short. And I thought, you know what? I don't um, I noticed that a lot of people in the remedy world when I first started this were defending themselves against claims, just like my wife and everybody else, because it's a natural reaction. Someone says something, you go on the defense. Well, because now it rails back to my childhood and a problem with authority, my natural reaction was, no, I'm not going to defend myself. I'm going to attack because you've attacked me. So I don't have to block you. I'm going to hit you harder. Mm -hmm. And then I started finding out all the anomalies within the financial system. And um, I mean, I don't want to go into too much. Obviously, it's not not a, a podcast on the financial system, but I'm sure you're aware of quite a few of them yourself. But the ones pertaining to debt itself and the bottom line, there are some fundamental rules that the claimant has to follow. He who makes the claim has the burden of proof. What I'm interested in is what is the legal required obligation that they have to produce the, the proof? And what is the proof that they have title? So those were my early days. And um, I was naive like anybody else, but they seemed to work. And they kept sending this and obfuscating and I was asking for specific documents and they were never sending them back. So I'm sitting there going, hmm, interesting. You're full of bluster and hot air, but you ain't actually give me what you're legally obligated to do. So you're coming out with every other. And then, you know, the old nut about um, we have opened up an internal investigation. Uh, it, give us six weeks and we'll get back to you. I'd immediately write back because I wasn't going to fall for that bullshit. And I turn and say, no, you don't seem to understand. I'm the one initiating the conversation here. And I'm not waiting six weeks for a bogus internal investigation because um, you've now got 21 days to answer the previous one. And if your memory's failing, here's a copy of the previous notice that you've had, right? You have now got 14 days, right? Be under no illusion. I will take you to court, right? I'm, I'm quite adversarial when it comes to those corporates. And uh, then they tell us that you can't take us to court. We're in a position or rest of it. You can. And, and then they gave, they went on to give me the consequences if I started legal action. Anyway, cut a long story short. I dragged their asses into court. This was linked finance. Uh, j just one of them as an example. Right. And I, I dragged them into court and um, they didn't get anywhere. Uh, and all that bluster and bullshit didn't work. Um, now, I wouldn't say I won the case. But I stop link from ever making a claim again against my wife or anybody else in this you know in, in my circle and not even the judge because because when people have these things we were in what they call a pre-court hearing because that's basically an assessment by a judge to see if it's got the legs to actually go to court it's just a no, fast track thing and i understood this and i really started doing my homework on on this stuff now because I was doing it live and, um, you know, life experience itself, not just a theory, the the um, you know, someone who just works on theory because he read it on the net. Um, I, I literally threw myself into the burning fires of hell just to see what would happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> so but have you got any fear, Rob? I used to, 
I, I mean, that whole period of time I'm talking to you about, um, I lost weight. I was so stressed. I was worried about the next letter coming through the door. I'm as human as anybody else. And the one thing that I wanted to do, though, was I didn't tell my wife just how stressed I was, but I was really stressed and I started to suffer panic attacks and all the rest of it. But that's what these letters are designed for and the frequency of them. Yeah. It's, it's psychological warfare. Mm. But then I started to learn to read things forensically like I would uh, when I was delivering NLP or hypnosis. And the one thing that clicked in my mind that got rid of the fear was I was sitting in the in the pre-court hearing, the judge lady sitting there and um, we're going blah, 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 backward and forward. The barrister for the other side, uh, it's, it's, it's all Zoom call because I think it was in the early COVID period right. um, or just before. Um, but anyway, my wife was sitting right next to me here and we're, we're on camera. There's the judge, there's Link Financial Services representative and, and there's myself. And I said, well, because my, my wife's from the Philippines and she hasn't got a great command of English, I will be acting on her behalf as a McKinsey friends. Um, they try, the barrister tried to shut that down and I turned around and said, uh, the due process. I said, she has a right to a defense Scenes that, and I asked the judge the question because remember, it's a pre court hearing, we're not in a court, mm. it is all about opinion, it's not procedural. And I said to the judge, I said, On the summons that I wrote, I wrote the CEO's name of Link Financial Services, and the court produced the same summons with the name on it. My question to you is, Who is he? Mm. He's a representative, correct? So, are you saying that? This person who hasn't turned up today can send a representative, but my wife can't have one. Is that what you're saying? Ah, uh, uh, right. Okay. Well, seeing you put it that way, I went exactly, and I'm like, you slimy bastards. Yeah. Anyway, we went hum to ha and hum to da. Now, the judge, in her defence, could see exactly I'd cracked it. Right. But there was a piece of the jigsaw missing, but she couldn't give it to me. So what she did was, and I got this case file and, and she could see the to and fro in and what I've asked for and, you know, all the rest of it. And she said, before we go any further, Robert, I'd like to ask you one question. You've stated that they've demanded money from, from your wife on several occasions, as, I, as you've evidenced in your case file. She said, I've read your case file. She said, and I have one question for you. I said, yeah, what's that? And I'm pretty quick on the take up. And she said, can you show me where in the file they actually claimed you that your wife owes them money? And with that question, I went, shut it. I said, I withdraw my claim. Thank you very much. And she went, you're welcome. She said, this is no need to go any further. I went, yeah, damn right. Right. I don't think even the barrister realized what just happened. And my wife certainly didn't. She's looked at me. She goes, what do you mean you're dropping the case? Yeah, what's going What's going on? I said, no need to go forward. No need. The judge did fire me a little wry smile as if to say, thank God he got it first time. Right. The barrister said, we'd like to put costs in for two and a half thousand pounds. I said, well, you're not getting that. And just said, excuse me, Mr. Demont. But she said, um, you know, I said, where's your full accounting? He said, we don't have any. I said, then you're not entitled to anything. I said, that's hearsay. You're just guessing. I said, and that's not due process. And she says, well, Mr. Demont, the court can order you to pay the costs. I said, yes, judge, if it was a court. But this is a pre-court hearing. You can't order me to do anything. You're here to advise whether or not we actually go to court. And I've just dropped the case. I said, so let me repeat, not paying them costs. And I turned to the barrister, I said, you want any costs? Take me to court. My wife's sitting there going, what are you doing? I said, I know exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> right? That was two and a half years ago. Obviously, they didn't have the balls to take me to court. But the question the judge asked, and I shut it and said, I'm dropping the case, was her saying, all debt collectors 
right? I would go so far now, I used to say 99% because there's always a few, but I would go so far to say all debt collectors, for your viewers, yeah. this is critical, all right? And buy my book, Diffusing the Debt Bomb 2 with optional AI because it will help you draft all your letters very quickly. And the AI is optional, so don't tell me I said it was included. It is and it isn't, but read the last chapter, okay? Now, you need an open AI account of your own in order to initiate the AI. It's as simple as that. And I have no financial interest or affiliation with open AI, so I'm not making money out of anybody on that score. But here's the critical part. Go through, and this is a message to your, your yeah. viewers and your listeners uh, now, go through every single correspondence that you have had with a debt agent and see if you can find the absolute sentence saying that you owe them directly, not the bank or anyone else, that you owe the debt agent any money. You will not find that sentence anywhere for a very good reason. They don't have the title or the legal right to make that statement. That in and of itself should tell you all you need to know. They do not have the deed of assignment. And why don't they have the deed of assignment? Well, that's easy if you know how the financial sector works, because they sell all of these as portfolios, investment portfolios, in bulk. And if you look at the uh, Laws of Property Act 1925, you will quite clearly see that each and every one of the thousands and thousands and thousands they send over on a USB or wherever it is they do, right, is irrelevant. What is relevant is they must have the deed of assignment on every single one. And that requires three signatures, the assignee, the assignor, and an independent witness. That's a full deed of assignment. If they can't produce that, they don't have title to the claim. Go away. And obviously the full accounting and all the rest of it. Now, some of them will turn around and say to you, we're working on behalf of Barclays Bank or whoever it might be. Right. You don't ever argue about the outstanding balance. That's the argument they want you to get in. You argue about their right to contact you. Where's your legal right to speak to me and send me letters? And that legal right stems from them holding the title, which they don't. So now that I'm in that position, I mean, after the court case, I wrote um, Street Gangs and Suits, right, uh, which is on my website. But then I got more experience over like the next couple of years to where I am now. And I'll be honest with you, Mel, I, I just I mean, if we ever I can't remember the last time a debt agent even wrote to this address and spoke to my wife or, you know, um, but um I, I have fun with them now for shits and giggles. Like they'll write and say, I mean, do you see debt agents? They'll send you it's a statement of account. So what? Do you act on a statement when the bank sends you one? No. Well, a statement isn't asking for any feedback whatsoever. It's just saying, here's a statement. Okay, so you've made a statement. And so that doesn't require a reply. And then they go things like, this is outstanding balance. To, to who? Hmm. Because you still haven't made a claim. So that doesn't require a reply. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they'll push everything towards you. We can help you arrange payment plan to pay this outstanding balance. Yeah, thank you, but no thanks. You know, do you see litigation in there anywhere? No. They make money out of people's ignorance of the law which is what a lot of them which is what most of them do yeah but for those who are no longer low-hanging fruit right on the bills of exchange i mean obviously i've got a lot further than in the remedy world and, and and the law the uk consumer not just uk consumer law but the cqv and all sorts of trusts and all sorts of other stuff right which i find fascinating and um so now, under the bills of exchange, I, I write stupid stuff back to them if I feel I want to have some fun. And I say, here's a picture of a rainbow unicorn in full and final settlement of the alleged debt. <laughs> and they're like, and you can imagine the look on their faces at the other end. Say, what the fuck? What? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, and by the way, if you keep that for 24 hours and don't send it back to me under the bill of exchange, the debt settled. Because the bill of exchange doesn't say it has to be money. It just says I'm using this as an exchange for full and final settlement. Have you still got my unicorn? You know, you just mess with them. And I stopped writing all of the legalese notices a long time ago. Um, because I'm in a position of confidence and power because of the knowledge I have now. All right. So there's no intimidation. And what you do is you cut their horns off by writing. Them. I mean, I like, for instance, um, to whom it may concern or to the reprobate that thinks he can get away with this bullshit. I actually write those words. <laughs> right. And I've actually invited CEOs. I said, if you want to stand in my crosshairs in a court and make a claim that you that I owe you this money, go right ahead, sunshine. I said, I look forward to the summons. Right. And then the only letter I got back, I recall from, um, I think it was, I can't remember what their name was, began with O. But um, the CEO wrote back. He said, we've given this account back to the original lender. In other words, no, I'm, we're just not dealing with this. You know, because I asked them several times, please take me to court. Let's see what happens. I said, just remember, though, that's cost compensation and my time will be added. To the outstanding balance that you're claiming is yours. We're working on behalf of the bank. Well, here's an email from the bank saying it's been closed and they have no legal or equitable interest in the matter. So you just lied on paper. That's fraud. Section two, 2006, by the way, in case you need your legal department to look it up, you know, blah, 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 blah. And when you get to that level, which which the, the latest book tells you and it gives you court citations as well. Do you know the ironic thing nowadays, Mel, is that most of the debt agents that are prevalent in the UK are citated in court, uh, are in the book with court citations of the very same company who lost based on the notices I've sent. So if people are going, oh, well, I'm dealing with PRA, I'm dealing with Lowe's, I'm dealing with Moorcroft, I'm dealing with that. That's okay. Go down the list, cut, copy, paste their case. They lost on what you just said and remind them of it because right. they're hoping you don't have that. Well, now you do. Yeah. And if you're not sure of how to draft the letter, that's okay. Boom, 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 boom. Ask the AI. Yeah, no problem. Bang. Give you court citations. It will give the laws that are breaking and all the rest of it. A simple phone, well, no, I wouldn't say phone call. A simple letter to your bank to say, and you don't give them any other clues as to what, but you just turn around and say, this is my name. This was the account number and everything. Can you give me the status of this account? And they will always say closed, which means no legal or equitable interest. So then when the debt agent writes back and say, we're acting on behalf of Barclays Bank or whoever it is, you got them because they're not and that's misrepresentation so rob i mean that is like so powerful uh, information for anybody that's watching and listening right now i mean just just that knowledge alone people will be empowered to to go and tell them to f off right yeah have you taken that so this is dealing with debt agencies have you taken your curiosity further into things like you know, loans with the with the bank or mortgages or anything like that. Have you have you got any appetite for that, or is it just simply you're going to stay with the debt agencies? Well, as I was saying earlier, Mel, and and I think it it does come down to morals, as it were. I do have the knowledge to go and get an unsecured loan and simply not pay it back. But if you're doing that with that intent. Um, to be honest with you, in law, that could be construed as fraud because you had no intentions of paying it back. Right. Uh, and morally speaking, irrespective of what you think of the other side, I just personally think it's wrong. I mean, I've had my income severely curtailed in the last six months, and it would be the easiest thing in the world for me to take out a £25,000 unsecured loan um, I'm not going to give you the mechanisms because they're absolutely so simple, but I don't want anybody out there following 
my suggestions but i can tell you now there's a three-step process you get the loan you do something else you keep the cash and there's nothing they can do about it and the, the but it's immoral i think um but that's just my opinion I and mean, i know there's going to be lots of your listeners going for fuck's sake well, I'm tell them what that is. you know um but you could get yourself in trouble because you are doing it with the intent not to and don't get me wrong because uh, someone said to me um yeah it's about intention to defraud well you're not because um there's another way that you can actually say no i'm going to settle the account you're talking bills of exchange and promissory notes right you can settle the account any way you like right you don't have to give them cash back just to see what i mean I yeah okay so that's interesting because I was reading something yesterday for my own personal stuff that's going on and in fact I used your um your AI extension as well as the normal chat GPT and you it was interesting because there were different results but um it said it said that the company that you're obviously trying to settle the debt with with the promissory note the way I read it, they can basically not agree to accept that. So, to, so to give you an okay. example, let, let, let's talk about a mortgage company, and it's in their articles of association. It clearly states that they accept promissory notes. Yeah. And then somebody's trying to settle their mortgage with a promissory note, and they're saying that doesn't come within the mortgage conditions of twelve point two, blah blah blah. Um, and it's not in the agreement, and we didn't agree this. And what I was reading was because I thought, well, it's a financial instrument. It's in the bills of exchange. They should accept it. And it says it in their articles of association. But they have got the right to not accept it. Is that right? Uh, yes and no. Because when it comes to and there is a difference between a bill of exchange and a promissory note. Right. Um, and the simple difference is a bill of exchange involves three parties. A promissory note involves two. Right. So in other words, there's an escrow portion to a bill of exchange. Right. Um, now, there are several ways you can deal with a bank, and I don't want to go too deeply into modern money mechanics and, and the mortgage thing, because that's one of the things I'm working on at the moment out in the private. Yeah. Um, but um, when it comes to promissory notes, I mean, we've got that famous phrase from Laws Denning that promissory notes must be uh, treated, treated yeah. as yeah. cash. All right. So you've got Supreme Court citations there. And it's not about arguing. It's about asking the right questions. Right. And, and, and getting them into a corner to say, well, that's full and final settlement. Right. And if your promissory note contains um, like, for instance, John of fifty thousand pounds sterling, blah 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 blah. Um, the promise to pay has been suspended because the gold and silver standard's been suspended. So until that is reinstated, yeah, which it never will be. Let's let's be honest. Then that's solid. Mm. Now, there's probably hundreds, if not thousands, of people out there writing bills of exchange slash promissory notes for all sorts of different reasons. Anybody and their fool can do that. The difference is, it's not the promissory note or the bills of exchange you need to be concerned with. It's the battle that you create afterwards in knowing how to uh, stand your ground from a, from a, a legal perspective because you're in commerce, right? And there's obviously over in the states you've got the UCC uh, one air, um, thing where you're the secure party creditor. And that kind of stuff although there are some aspects not all but there are some aspects where that ucc one works as a foreign uh agent as well so but you would have to know your position inside out and back to front the mistake i see a lot of people making mel is oh i've i've figured out how to write a promise note. great now what you need to do before you send it is figure out how to defend it depending on who you're sending it to and if you're going to send it to the banks, you went straight from lightweight to heavyweight championship without <laughs> learning to walk in between. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So, and the remedy world is full of mistakes like that. 
you know, and it's it, it's part of everybody's journey. And don't get me wrong. I mean, I've sent along with a few friends of mine. Uh, we work as a research group, very close knit research group. And uh, we know for a fact that the Treasury is sitting on 100 million pound. Promissory note that they've securitized. We already know this. But what people don't realize is um, we weren't waiting for the rejection or anything like that because they were never going to reject that. All right. They made the HMRC, in this case, the Treasury, they made the mistake of giving us what we call a TO number. Which is verification that that's been sent. If you don't get a TO number off HMRC, you ain't got anything. And we're now sitting on two TO numbers that we could invoke at any point in the future that we want and have that battle. But we're not ready to have that battle yet. All right, because like I said, with everything else, I like to get all my ducks in a row and make it absolutely airtight. So it's not a case of we're saying this, they're saying that. It's literally a default judgment. It, it, sorry, it's a summary judgment. There's nowhere for you to go judge. And so we move the court for a summary judgment. That's my my personal way to go. Because unlike the cap in hand for the CQV and all this kind of stuff and promissory notes, all the rest of it, you're asking the other party to accept something. Whereas we're telling them to and you don't have a choice. Because we've already done our homework and a world of pain is coming your way and you will lose if you reject this. Now, I already know people who've literally written promissory notes to HMRC and they've accepted them. So it's possible, but you're talking about people who have worked diligently for years to understand how to get it accepted. And then the ability to call in a professional to forensically track the exchange the Securities Exchange Commission, because all of our taxes, all of our money, all of everything in the banking system all gets centralized in the uh, state of Colombia, in what they call the corporate USA. All right. The spiritual side of your personage is obviously the Vatican. And then you've got the London, which is uh, where well, you've got the financial in London on the surface of it. You've got the spiritual in the Vatican and you've got the military arm in, in the corporate USA, which is only the state of, um, uh, not, I keep saying Columbia. Um, Washington. Yeah. So, no, it's not Washington. Because we see, I forgot, it's just completely gone out of my head. Um, I'm sure some of your viewers will be sitting there biting at the thinking, Rob, it's this, it's this, it's this. But I've got so much stuff flying around, I'm sure it'll pop into my head. Um, but the point being is, you've got these three independent states of the countries that they sit in. And for good reason because this is where the three crowns come into it in terms of literally controlling the world. Because you've got the military, you've got the finance and you've got the spiritual. And so they've got all of those box ticks. So all the money goes there. The spiritual stuff goes there. Like, you know, you're talking about your birth certificate and, and all the rest of it. Um, and then you've got your finances in London where we're all trying to claw it, the CQV trust and all the rest of it. And yeah, there's people out there going, oh, Rob, look, it's a conspiracy theory. The CQV doesn't exist. The trust doesn't exist. Yeah, well, why is there's laws still there that say CQV 1666 and 1707? You know, and read the damn remedy. So the evidence is there of what's been done or perpetrated. All you've got to do is figure out how to open the door. You know, so uh, because we are born for a first few minutes as secured party creditors. And then within, what is it, 28 or 40 days under UK law, you've got to register the birth. Mm. Now you're a debtor in the fictional context. But for 40 days of your young born life, you were free. You were the secured party creditor. And then you became the fictional ward of the state. And that piece of paper is your security bond that is tapped into, which is what your CQV is based on for the rest of your life. So when you get, for instance, um, you know, here's something for your your viewers to think about. Like when you get a bill, right? I think I've got a, got an example here. I don't know. Uh, does that have it? Uh, no, that's not it. 
Well, I'll give you an example. So when you when 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 you get a bill, all right, on the bottom of it, you know the 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 the, the, the bank pay gyro slip thing. Yeah. Right. Ask yourself. Now, I know people are probably aware of um, accepted for value and all the rest of it. That's not where this is going. All right. Where it's going is, for God's sake, read what's in front of you. At that gyro slip, what does it say? It says gyro credit slip. It doesn't say debit. It's not saying you are the debtor. There's the credit. So the credit, the numbers are already filled. It's already there. So you sign it, put a little bit on it, and then put the arrow back up to the outstanding balance, which matches what that credit is, and go, yep, yeah, I, I confirm that. So would you just use that credit to pay? Thank you very much. You have a choice. You use that. They're giving you the choice. Use that credit slip or pay out of your own bank account. What do most people do? Pay out of their own bloody bank account. It says credit. Learn to see what's in front of you. What what would you do? I've noticed the time. We're obviously uh, over the hour at this point. Um, but what would you do for because you know the councils now are very uh, good at not sending out any gyro slips anymore. Um, and I'm sure there are other organisations that don't. And everything's paperless and blah 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 blah. So what would you do in that circumstance if you're really struggling to get the gyro slip from the organisation? Well, the gyro slip normally comes. Um with what we call a true bill and if you look in law just just ask the ai that you've already got access to what is a true bill now when it comes to court we talk about controversy you will only go to court if you cause or create controversy now, if you can evidence that you're not creating controversy, you want answers to certain questions. And, 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 and what I found from my personal experience, and none of this is legal advice, it's just my journey. Um, but knowing what questions to ask gives you a lot of power. And that can only come through research. And then all of a sudden you get over the apex and it becomes a lot easier. Mm. Um, and when it comes to whether it's the council or any other corporation, because that's all they are. Yeah. Um, if they're in commerce and there's money involved that's stating that you owe X, you require a true bill. Yeah. Not an invoice, not a statement, a true bill in commerce for the money you're claiming I owe you. That has to contain the ability for you to settle the account. If they refuse to give you a true bill, there's something fishy going on in law. And you can then start a whole other series of questions. Sorry, I don't understand. Why are you not sending me to? That's the way we work. I don't give a shit about your company policy. It doesn't trounce the laws of contract and the laws of this land. I want a true bill and I'm happy to pay it if it works out that it's correct. So you're not refusing to pay anything. You never do. But you want evidence. And, 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 and remaining in honor will then allow you to not pay, don't use the word pay, settle the account. So you want a true bill, there's, there's the key. And also the other important key is, don't get into any arguments about the whys and wherefores of why you're in court and this, that and the other. The strongest argument you've got, even before that even begins, is establishing who's got jurisdiction. It's always going to be down to jurisdiction, because if you don't give them jurisdiction, which they need to have, yeah. there is no case irrespective of what the content of the case is. OK, so what you're basically saying is if you make sure they don't take jurisdiction and let's say the judge walks out of the room because he can't claim jurisdiction. So what you're saying then, if that happens, yep. the case is gone. Yeah, because you are now the highest authority in that court and you just say the words, I dismiss the case. And the clerk of the court puts it on the record. Or they won't allow you to say anything and they'll try and bring you back again to try and get jurisdiction and yeah. you just repeat what you said previously. And believe yeah. me, sooner or later, they'll just turn around. If you hold your ground, 
and not give them jurisdiction, the case has to be dismissed. They don't have authority over you. You have to give them permission to have authority over you because, as again, Lord Denning said, all administrative courts are an abhorrence to English law. Yeah. They are star chambers, administrative courts, nothing more. They are corporate entities, right? That's it. They are not part of the true judicial system. And you, that's why you do not get the court record because it's not on the court records because it's not in a court. Yeah. And people need to realize the scam. You're in an office that's calling itself a court. Yeah. Yeah. That's all. And nobody in there has got jurisdiction over you unless you give it to them. And then what you're calling jurisdiction is merely an agreement to a contract. And you just gave acquiescence to a verbal contract by saying, stand up, sit down. My name is confirming my name. Don't do it. Mm. Irrespective of what the, you believe the severity of the content is, you can stop them in the tracks before they even get that far. Yeah. Okay. So there's, it's all about jurisdiction. Yeah. Okay. In my opinion. Cool. Um, thank you. Um, what's, so obviously you, we didn't even get to talk about you losing your YouTube channel and everything, but you're now, I know, um, you're now on Rumble, which is where you're now re sort of growing. And yeah. what sort of, what are you focusing on right now? And what's, What's in there? I know that there's something else going on in the background, which you're not going to talk about, but is that sort of swamping you completely or, or have you got other irons in the fire? Oh, no, I, I'm, I'm at a level now where I'm doing that as a side thing for shits and giggles. And right. um, the, the, the content at the moment, obviously, um, I'm having a look through the back catalogue of my most popular videos on YouTube, which I have on my hard drive, and I'm uploading those episodes as and when I can. Um, it's, I've been really busy this week with with other research that takes priority, um, and I'm sure my subscribers understand that the the, the number that there are. Um, but eventually, yes, I'm going to build back up on Rumble. I'm still debating whether or not to re-energize YouTube and start again because the bottom line is people say, "Oh, you're a fool for doing that." But logically speaking, that's where the mass of traffic is. Mm. It, it's as simple as that. Now, obviously, my experiences with YouTube are not a happy one. So for the time being, I'm happy to stay on Rumble and have my fingers in other pies in, in terms of um, dealing with stuff and still researching a lot. But um, I am working at the moment hard on um, trusts. Uh, I don't write trusts for anybody, but similar to Diffusing the Debt Bomb 2 with its optional AI, this will be about trust and you will have an AI quite capable of writing um, unincorporated private trusts and, and all sorts of other stuff. So, so you, it's, it's, a, it's a trust mentor. All right. And you can then judge for yourself as an individual whether that trust suits your your needs and all the rest of it, because, you know, the average trust is what, three, five thousand pounds. But then it will probably end up as a statutory trust, uh, which is not much of a protection anyway. But um, it, it will allow the user to uh, educate themselves very, very quickly on on the not just the basics of trust, but quite complex matters. So that's one of the, the, the products I, I'm working on at the moment. And these are not five minute jobs no. um, because they have to be tested to destruction before I'll even put them out in the public. Uh, but it will be the same model as 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 uh, um, diffusing the debt bomb. And then obviously we've got. Uh, I'm, I'm considering what type of new content and it's going to be really a mix between my love for the esoterical history and the legal. Uh, and it depends what my fancy is during the week and what information comes my way. You know, um, I'm actually doing some research. It's going to sound like really tinfoil stuff at the moment, but I got really interested in the practicalities of time travel. Nice. Um, but not a time travel machine or anything like that. But this is going back to my days in hypnosis where you can move the consciousness forward into time. Um, and the, the imagery that the mind sees, if this project goes accordingly, will actually be in front of you on a screen rather than in your head. Oh, wow. Um, 
which makes it real. Because I was saying to a colleague of mine who is a physicist, I'm not dealing with an idiot, um, that uh, one of the things I want to do to prove to myself is have a photograph of that screen. And if that image comes in my phone of that screen with the content on it, we've already moved from here to there. In other words, something has been created in the materialistic world from the energetic mental capacity. So that's the kind of stuff I'm, I'm, I'm dabbling in at the moment. Um, and so, you know, because I just stay, it's about staying curious. Yeah. And, and yes, I did lick my wounds for a couple of months and it hit me hard because I think what hit me the hardest about getting YouTube channel taken down um, and everything else wasn't wasn't the actual takedown or anything like that, because I didn't realize until afterwards that it was someone had taken away my legacy that I'd built for five years, which 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 meant more to me than anything else. That if I if I popped this mortal coil, there'd be stuff there for people to benefit from. And now someone has taken that all away. That to me was the biggest blow, not yeah. profit margins or anything like that, but tools and, and, and ideas and suggestions to, to to help people. I wanted to leave something like that. Now I'm still going to, but it will probably be on Rumble, but it will still exist. You know, and it's, I mean, when you consider the hundreds and hundreds of videos that I've created over that period of time, it, it's quite a job to go back through that old back catalogue and six hard drives to actually pick out, you know, that, those ones. So that's where I am at the moment. Um, but I will be focusing on building up Rumble. It's been a while. Um, and quite recently, I came back from uh, a trip in the Far East because, uh, as I say, my wife's from the Philippines. So we spent uh, a few weeks in the Philippines and some time in Singapore. Uh, I've only been back to 10 days now. Um, so there was a gap in any activity I was doing, but that's because I needed that. I mean, that trip was organized long before all the shit hit the fan yeah, anyway. Yeah. Um, but I needed that to charge my batteries. Yeah, I'm I didn't realize just how much. But then when I sat back in the driver's seat again, it's like, right, it's almost like the dragon's now risen again. You know, and uh, for you people out in the remedy world who think you've won, you haven't. And that's all I've got to say. Mm. Uh, you haven't won, and uh, karma's a bitch. Mm. Um, on that note, um, if people want to reach out to you, um, obviously you've got the book that they can find, and I'll put all your links in the show notes. Um, because the book is just an ebook, you don't get a printed version. Let's make that very clear um where's the best place for people to reach out to you if they wanted to know more or or, or whatever or uh, they can always happy to, i mean i'm not hiding behind anything they can email me directly uh, robert at pegasusvideos.com that's my daily email that's the one you use to talk to me and yeah. that's the one that everybody can in fact that email is also on my website so if you have any problems on downloading any product on my site and there's a glitch in the system, just email me and I'll send it directly via email the moment I read yours. Yeah. So, you know, so I've got nothing to hide and I'm completely transparent, you okay. know. Perfect. And um, once again, I have forgotten uh, our mutual friend that uh, put us in touch, keeps saying, Mal, you don't say like, share and subscribe, um, which I forgot to do again at the beginning. So please like, share and subscribe. Um, I mean, this this conversation has been absolutely jam packed with amazing knowledge. So I think I think it's going to get a lot of likes, um, which will be great. Final parting words, anything you feel called to share, Rob, before we wrap up today? I think from my own personal experiences, um, not just recently, but, you know, as a journey, is that just when you think you're beaten, there's something inside that will awaken you and you will benefit from the fact that that negativity has given you more strength than you could imagine that you had before. And if you know you're right, you're right. And don't let anybody tell you any difference. You know, um, and I, with your permission, Mel, 
will share our conversation on my Rumble channel as well, and we can cross-reference both platforms uh, mm -hmm. so more people get to see this. And um, don't, don't let anybody tell you that you're wrong or your journey is on the wrong path. It's your journey and stick to what you know in your heart is correct. That's all I can say. Wow. Do you know what? That is so powerful. And I've heard it before. I've heard it very recently. Um, but the way you just delivered that really spoke to my heart because I'm on my own journey right now, which I am having self-doubts massively about because of the perceived consequences. Um, and they so are perceived. <laughs> yeah. my grandma had a fantastic saying and she used to say robert just remember something most of the things we worry about in life don't actually exist yeah and he was absolutely right she is i always say that the thought is always worse than the reality every single time yeah. Yeah. um well thank you words of wisdom indeed and i'm going to take those close to my heart as well it's been an absolute pleasure to meet you and to have this conversation with you i know that so many people are going to get so much value out of this uh thank you rob thank I you hope so too. and uh, i appreciate you taking the time to have a chat with me Matt. really do no problem all right take care and goodbye everybody and keep up the fight absolutely thanks rob